Okay, good afternoon. It's time to get started. I am Kostas Panos. I'm the director of Citrus, and I keep repeating this because it says here, introduce yourself. Uh, so I would like to welcome the web viewers, and I would like to let you all know that this is actually the last Citrus Research Exchange for the semester. Uh, even though we're cheating a little bit because we have two major events coming up that I would like to, take you, to tell you about. Uh, one is happening tomorrow. We have John Mank Markov from the New York Times. He will speak here at 11 a.m. tomorrow uh, on Machines of Loving Grace. Uh, as it says here, this is a history of the complicated and evolving relationship between humans and computers. And this is sponsored by the new initiative, People and Robots, the new Citrus Initiative, People and Robots. Uh, a little bit later, on May the 14th, we are hosting and presenting a conference uh, under the name of Who Owns the Data? This is an international conference on digital assets, data philanthropy, and public benefit. And this is presented by Citrus in partnership with INRIA and EIT ICT Labs. Uh, this conference, Who Owns the Data?, is going to bring together data scientists, entrepreneurs, and representatives of public agencies, advocacy organizations, and the private sector from the United States and Europe. Should be quite interesting. And today, we are honored to uh, host uh, Lisa Getur for the last uh, uh, research exchange of the semester. Uh, Lisa is a professor in the computer science department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research areas include machine learning, data integration and reasoning under uncertainty, with an emphasis on graph and network data. She received her PhD from Stanford University, her MS from the University of California at Berkeley, and her BS from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And she was a professor at the University of Maryland, College Park from 2001 to 2013. Lisa? Great. Um, thank you. So it's very nice to uh, be back at Berkeley after a very, very long time. Uh, I actually did my master's with Stuart Russell, and don't tell them how long ago that was. Uh, and um, I have just recently joined uh, UC Santa Cruz, so I'm very happy to be back in uh, California and back in the Bay Area. And I just recently joined Citrus as a PI, so it's really nice to be here and to um, talk about the stuff that I'm doing, hopefully find some connections between what I'm doing and what you guys are doing. Um, and uh, so thanks for having me and uh, letting me be the last in your uh, series. I'm actually going to be back here next week uh, for this Who Owns the Data, talking about a different topic, uh, talking about privacy. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about big graph data science. Um, and let me start with actually the most important part of the talk, which is acknowledgments. Um, so I have an awesome group of students, uh, links for Lisa's inquisitive students. Uh, right now they're split between half of them are on the East Coast, uh, still at University of Maryland, half of them are at Santa Cruz. But you know, working with students is you know, the best part of being a researcher. Uh, uh, my sponsors. And then um, before I go into the main body of the talk, since I am kind of new here and looking for collaboration, I want to kind of give a bigger overview of my research. So my research really spans uh, machine learning. Um, and in particular, within machine learning, I'm very interested in how you combine structure, whether the structure is coming from logical structure or database schema information, together with statistical and probabilistic models. And um, this talk is mainly going to be kind of in this general area. Um, but I also do work in databases. Um, and in particular, I do work in data integration, uh, graph databases, and probabilistic databases. And for the probabilistic databases, a lot of this work has been joint with Amal Deshpande, who actually got his PhD from here with Joe Hellerstein. So there's another connection. Um, I don't. Uh, this isn't my main area of research, but I have done a little bit in visual analytics because I think the kinds of problems you do when you're looking at these rich, heterogeneous kind of data really need um, visualizations and tools that allow you to understand the recommendations made. Um, I believe that you need ones that are kind of 
suited to your analytic task at hand, so you can't just have a a generic graph viz tool to support these things. And uh, my group has developed several of these. Um, but then I'm motivated by diverse application areas. And I think um, hopefully you see these application areas that are all kind of connected to things that uh, Citrus is interested in. I think all of them have this mix of needing to reason probabilistically, integrate the data, and make use of structure. I'm particularly interested in this area of computational social science, and you'll see that come up a little bit in what I'm talking about. Um, okay, but now to get into the kind of main part of the talk. So, big data. So we all know, you know, it's the age of big data, dawn of big data, the deluge of big data, the tsunami of big data, and so on. Um, but one of the points that I want to make is that data is not flat. In particular, big data is not flat. So it's multimodal, multi-relational, spatio-temporal. There's a lot of important things about understanding the entities, understanding the relationships between the entities in order to do good data science and make um, good decisions. Uh, but I would characterize uh, most of machine learning takes this wonderful structured data and takes it and flattens it and puts it into a table. And then this table you feed into your MATLAB code, your R code, and so on, and do all kinds of things, including trying to extract out again the structure that was already in the data in the first place. Um, so I really think we need data science for graphs. Um, so we need data science that really can look at this structure. And when I say graphs here, I really do mean this kind of more general notion of graphs, that they're multi-relational and so on. So not things where you have a single edge type and a single node type, but uh, richer than that. And so, um, you know, everybody knows the uh, Vs of big data. So uh, volume, velocity, variety, or the three Vs, the five Vs, the seven Vs, however you count them. Um, so we need a new V that captures this graphy notion. Say again? Visual, Visual yes. Um, but for graphs, I usually ask people, you know, so what's a good V for graphs? Usually I get vertex. Um, but about a year and a half ago, I gave this talk at um, Penn State's uh, big social science data, and there was a, a IGERT program, and uh, there were folks that knew more Latin and uh, so on, and so they gave me a V, uh, which is vinculate. And vinculate means the ties between things, so there really is a V that captures this kind of graph structure. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over some kind of patterns, um, some key ideas for dealing with graphs, and then a particular tool developed in my group. And these first two parts of the talk are going to be very general, hopefully something that kind of is accessible to everybody and something that kind of gets you thinking about what are the kinds of inferences that we do in graphs, how do they differ than cla from classic kind of classification and clustering and so on. Um, and then when I get to the tools, then I'll get into a little bit more technical detail and um, uh, depending on your preference, you can wake up or uh, uh, go to sleep at that point. And then I'll, I'll wrap up though, trying to end on some of the general problems that I think are particularly of interest uh, within Citrus, hopefully. Um, so p for patterns, I'm going to start with what I think are very basic kinds of micro predictions that are useful in graphs. And so these are, you know, very simple and, um, but important. So the first one is collective classification. And by collective classification, I just simply mean inferring the labels for nodes in a graph. And so let me give you a kind of cartoon example of that. I have some social network where I have different kinds of relationships between people, and then I'm trying to label the nodes according to their uh, political persuasion. 
And um, obviously this is kind of a US centric uh, example. But the notion is that I'm going to have some labels and then what I want to do is infer the labels for the unknowns here. So again, you know, this is about the simplest kind of graph inference problem you can do is infer labels for the nodes in the graph. Um, another very simple uh, kind of inference you may want to do is link prediction, where link prediction is um, inferring the existence of edges in a graph. And let me set this one up with, again, a simple example, but you know, a little bit richer, where I have some sort of communication network where I have entities that are people that are communicating, they have certain kinds of messages, and there are certain kinds of observed relationships in this data, like the communication relationships and the co-location, but then we're trying to predict another kind of edge that has different semantics, um, where the relationship could be supervisor, subordinate, colleague, and so on. So again, a simple kind of inference problem in graphs where I'm trying to predict a uh, kind of link. This is closely uh, related to making recommendations and so on, recommending friends and things like that. Um, and then the last one uh, that again I think is a kind of micro example of a graph inference problem that is important is entity resolution. And for entity resolution, this is figuring out when two nodes are referring to the same underlying individual. Um, this problem is ubiquitous in computer science. Uh, one of the things that's very ironic about it is that entity resolution goes by a lot of different names in a lot of different subfields. I'm always looking for new names for this, so if you have any to add to this, let me know. Um, but the, let me try and motivate the importance of this problem with a really simple example. So this is a author co-authorship network. So the nodes are authors, the links are co-authorship links. And this data set, this is a fragment from a much larger data set, but it was used in an InfoViz challenge problem in like 2004. And supposedly, you know, the domain experts had gone in there, you know, they knew all the people, it was extensively hand clean, there were no errors in the data whatsoever. Um, but if you start looking at it, and start trying to clean the data. You see that you get out a completely different network than the network that you had as input. And so if you think about doing any kind of graph analytics on the original data, all of your statistics are going to be wrong. You know, the degree distribution is going to be wrong, the path lengths are going to be wrong, and pretty much any conclusion you get from the data is going to be wrong. Um, and this um, cleaned up now, it gives a much nicer story, you know, it's a nice clean co-author clique. And I really want to emphasize, anybody that's working with graph data, you really need to think about whether this potentially can be an issue in your data, because there's other examples of places where people have looked at data that didn't have the resolution done properly and actually gotten incorrect scientific conclusions from this. The most famous is about the fragility of the internet where they hadn't properly done the resolution of the routers. Um, so these are uh, three very basic patterns in doing data science for graphs. Uh, but my favorite inference pattern is one that actually combines all of these, and I call this graph identification. So this, in graph identification, the notion is you take this noisy observational graph, and from the noisy observational graph, you do the necessary entity resolution, link prediction, and node labeling in order to um, extract out the graph 
the, then is the graph that you want to do your science on. Um, and here's a kind of simple example of that, again with the communication network, where the idea is you have a communication network and you're trying to infer out a social network, in particular uh, organizational hierarchy. And what's involved is you start with this data and you need to map the email addresses to actual entities and go through this process of inferring the nodes. You need to predict the edges in the output graph, so the social relationships, and then finally you need to infer the labels for the nodes. And these labels can be, you know, what their role is in an organization. And this template of combining together these um, micro patterns is something that very much motivates my research of, you know, how do you do the statistical inference for finding uh, one of these graphs. So what are some of the kind of key ideas that go into pretty much any solution for these problems? So I'm trying to be agnostic initially about what the particular methods one's using, but abstract from that, what are kind of common things that people need to think about? And um, the key ideas, three of the key ideas um, are here. Uh, the first one I think is very important, and going back to our example from before of this flattening process that is currently being done by a lot of machine learning methods, I really think we need more declarative feature construction so that at least we keep track of, you know, what went into this process of constructing these features from this graph. And when you're thinking about it in a, a general way, you can define these relational features and when you're thinking about making node predictions, there are certain kinds of common classes of features to use. Oftentimes these are things that summarize or some aggregate of the relational neighbors, um, some sort of structural properties, counting triangles and things like that. Um, then oftentimes when you're doing link prediction or entity resolution, really you want features that summarize properties of pairs of nodes. And there's a lot of kind of issues with doing that, but those can look at, you know, similarities between the nodes, overlap in neighborhoods, and so on. Um, and actually, I have a tutorial that goes through, you know, 12 slides on different aspects of this. So if you're interested, I'm happy to give you more information here. But the point that I really want to make is we need a language for defining these features. And um, within, uh, like statistics and so on, and machine learning, you know, feature engineering is usually kind of a dirty word, you know, oh, it's like you're doing feature engineering, that's really bad. But then if you go talk to people in industry, usually they say, oh, you know, what I spend all my time doing is feature engineering. So somehow I think we need to have a way to you know, make this more reputable, and it, this is fundamental in the process of making things reproducible. So um, as the data changes and so on, if we don't have a way of capturing the process through which we did the feature engineering, there's um, serious issues. So once you've done this feature engineering, then what people often do is just treat it as a flat classification problem. So um, you basically take all those relational features that you've constructed, you put them into your favorite off-the-shelf classifier um, and so on, and um, this can be really efficient, it can work really well. Um, it's actually very, very commonly done. Um, the only issue is it's making oftentimes very incorrect independence assumptions. Uh, there's a limitation that you can only use the features that are based, that you've observed in the data, so you can't make use of uh, the inferred uh, values. And then it can be 
hard to represent um, global constraints. So typically when things are put in this independent setting, you're going to make all of the decisions independently and um, uh, if you want to impose something like um, transitivity or acyclicity, it ends up being something that you kind of paste on after the fact. And this is an area where I think there's real opportunity for research. There's uh, both at the theoretical end for understanding the implications of the independence assumptions that are made when you flatten things and in terms of systems, having systems that really do support this kind of declarative um, uh, approach. So that's one idea. Um, the next is collective reasoning. And let me um, illustrate the collective reasoning back with my um, examples. Uh, so we had our example where we're trying to predict the political persuasion of a node. And I can do that by looking at things like the uh, campaign contribution. So if they um, donate to a particular party, maybe they're more likely to be uh, a member of that party or vote for a party. Uh, you can look at things like what they tweet about and say, okay, well, if they mention certain uh, phrases, they're more likely to be one party or the other. So I definitely want to use all the kind of local information, all the information I have about an individual to make the prediction. But then I also want to make use of the graph structure. And so for the graph structure, remember from before I had the social network and I have some labels, then what I would like to do is be able to do things like say, well, if my friend voted for a particular party, um, then I'm more likely to vote for a party. Maybe I'm going to give this a little bit lower weight. I'll talk about the semantics of these a little bit later, but for now just say, you know, a uh, higher one is, has more um, influence. And uh, you know, a spouse, again, I um, am more likely to vote for the same party, perhaps. And then the collective reasoning is the fact that I'm going to make the predictions for the labels. I'll use the local information, but then I'll also use the information from my neighbors in doing this. And then making an inference for this node, I'll use the observed labels, but also what I've inferred for a neighbor, um, and so on. So the idea here is that I'm going to jointly predict these labels. I'm not going to predict them independently. And now the way that you actually do that, there's a variety of different ways to have a probabilistic model that will jointly reason over there. These I'll talk about one of them in particular in a sec. Um, going to the link prediction example, again, there's an opportunity for this kind of collective reasoning where um, if I'm trying to infer something about the type of relationship, I can start by trying to infer the type of email. So I may be able to say, okay, there's certain kinds of emails. Some of them are social emails. Some of them are deadline emails. Then, based on that, I can say something about, well, if a person sends a deadline email, there's more likely to be a supervisor relationship. And then I can have a kind of definitional kind of reasoning that says, well, if someone's a supervisor of A and the supervisor of C, then B and C are colleagues. And I can make this a hard constraint or a soft constraint, depending on how I want to do things. So another example of kind of reasoning and dependencies between these things. Um, and then the last one is for entity resolution where, you know, if I'm trying to figure out are A and B the same, referring to the same individual, I can have something that looks at local information. So I can have something that looks at just the names or the string similarity of the names and say, okay, if there's a certain string similarity, then they're more likely to be co-referent. I can encode a bunch of different string similarities. I can look at the overlap in the sets of friends. So if there's a overlap in the friends, 
they're more likely to be the same. And then finally, I can have some sort of transitivity um, constraint saying if A and B are the same and B and C are the same, then A and C are the same. So the issue with doing this kind of collective reasoning where I have you know, one decision depend on another, especially in these graph settings, is that, you know, I won't go into all the details here, but basically the outputs depend on each other, and so the joint, we need to reason jointly. Um, but the challenge is that we have really, really large, really, really loopy graphs. And um, it's well known that probabilistic inference methods applied to these settings um, often don't work very well. So then the last thing I want to talk about briefly, another kind of key idea is, um, it goes by a number of different names in different communities, but um, lifted models, the idea that you kind of have repeated dependencies occurring in multiple places in the model, and you want to have a compact way of representing these. And so um, if people are familiar with HMMs, HMMs are like one of the simplest examples of how you capture this kind of common Markov dependence in a linear setting. Now the interesting issue is how do you capture these in a much richer graph setting, and how do you do this in a way that First off, um, makes learning and generalization work, um, uh, so that's an advantage of them, but then also making this um, speed up doing inference and learning. And again, this is a place where I think there's a lot of opportunity for research. There's um, uh, methods both in machine learning and also in databases where they're trying to make use of these kind of lifted models. Okay, so these were some key ideas. Um, now let me talk about a particular tool that um, we've been developing in my group for kind of solving these kinds of problems. And it's called uh, probabilistic soft logic. Um, the code, it's open source, is available here. We have a bunch of data sets that go with the papers. I'm going to go into a little bit of technical detail here, but um, there's a lot more, so I'm, I'm happy to talk with folks offline in more detail about the, the work. But let me um, uh, preface it to say there's a whole line of work on probabilistic programming on which we're building. and so. Our methods are very related to other methods that have been proposed and kind of, I think, try to bring together the best of those and then make some new contributions, especially new contributions around scalability. Um, so probabilistic soft logic is a probabilistic programming language for doing these kind of collective inference problems. And um, the language is a kind of logic-y looking language, kind of data log looking. Uh, the key thing is don't interpret it as a logic program. Um, where we basically have rules uh, and we have some sort of input database. Together those define a probabilistic program. Um, that gives a distribution over some unknown random variables, where the unknown random variables actually correspond to all the things that I talked about, the node labels, the links, the entity resolution decisions, and so on. Um, one thing that's different about this probabilistic programming language than most is that the random variables are continuous. Um, and we also allow uh, rich constraints, which not all of these languages allow, and we do a lot with aggregates. But the high level bit is that we make reasoning scalable by mapping these logical rules to convex functions. And um, 
the really, I think, beautiful thing about this is that we get to the same interpretation, the same optimization through actually three different lines of reasoning. And I'm going to go through one line of reasoning kind of in some amount of detail and then I'll get to the other two lines of reasoning. The, to me, the fact that you're getting to the same optimization from three different directions actually is really cool and is a sign of uh, the fact that there, there's something kind of fundamental here. But this is all very fresh work. As a matter of fact, the paper that describes this is going to be presented next week at AI and Stats. Um, so the rules, you know, you saw in my toy examples some examples of the rules, right? So they're, they're simple kinds of rules. I'm uh, going to write them out as these logical rules where I have conjunctions in the head, disjunctions, or conjunctions in the body and uh, disjunctions in the head. And um, I'm going to index the variables uh, 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 in each of these. And I'm going to rewrite this in just a clausal form. So this is a big disjunction. An equivalent way of writing this is this big disjunction where I have the um, variables that are in the body are going to be negated and in the head um, they'll, I won't change their sign. So um, I had this uh, set up, then the standard thing to do with these is to define a probability distribution over you know, the weights that we had in the rules over these clauses and looking at this distribution, what we would like to do is we'd like to find the most probable assignment to these values. And this corresponds to a classic problem, uh, MaxSat, uh, everybody's uh, favorite uh, combinatorial uh, MP-hard problem. And so uh, you're saying, okay, well, what, what advantage have we gotten here? Um, so let's work with this a little bit more. Um, what we can do, this is still working in the um, kind of discrete setting where I'm thinking of these as combinatorial, so they're 0 or 1. Now let's make the transformation where we really think of these as um, continuous values between 0 and 1, and we're going to interpret in this first setting these as rounding probabilities. So they're basically the probability that a literal will be rounded up to 1 in the solution or rounded down to 0 in the solution. So then I can um, write the expected score of a clause in this kind of simple format. It's just 1 minus the probability that at least one of them is true. Um, then I can say the total expected score is as follows. Um, but solving this problem is still hard. So it's highly non-convex. But now I can make use of actually a very old result in the combinatorial optimization world for uh, approximation that bounds this and that will give me a linear program. And this goes through kind of simple math. You know, I won't go through it for everybody here. I'm happy to talk more about it. But the nice thing is it gives us a guarantee on how good the solution is. And I can solve it using a linear program. So what we've done is we've kind of taken something that was a combinatorial optimization problem, we've converted it to a linear program. You know, this makes us happy. Uh, we can 
improve things even further using some state-of-the-art methods in consensus optimization. This gives you a fast and scalable approach. This is an approach that also can be parallelized in very interesting ways. Um, but fundamentally, what we've done is we've gone to something that's combinatorial, exponential. We can um, solve it using some kind of interior point method that gives us a speed up. And then we can use ADMM to make things even faster. So this is a cartoon example of it, uh, honing in on the difference between ADMM and the um, interior point method. We're taking things that would take, you know, 120 minutes to do um, using some off-the-shelf um, uh, approach and solving them in two minutes using ADMM. So uh, this is very good. So the that's one interpretation. So going from uh, combinatorial optimization to a maxat where we solve the maxat using a relaxation and that relaxation gives us performance guarantees. The interesting thing is a second interpretation for this is the um, pseudo marginals of a local consistency relaxation that people often do when they're working with these kinds of graphical models. And it turns out that this um, very uh, popular way of solving message passing in the graphical models community, again, works out to exactly the same thing. So that's wonderful. And it actually gives guarantees to problems that didn't have guarantees before. Then the um, third interpretation for these values is also as um, kind of similarities. So one of the first problems that we were looking at when we were doing this work was doing kind of alignment problems where we were trying to do ontology alignment, mapping classes to relationships and so on. And in this work, it started off saying, you know, it's a zero one, match, not match. But it turns out, it makes a lot more sense to talk about, well, how similar they are, because they're not exact matches between some of these classes. And um, we can interpret these continuous values as similarities. We can introduce a notion of distance to satisfaction, which I won't go through, but it turns out that the math of this gives exactly the same optimization as before. And so we can show that the exact solution for this is equivalent to the other two approaches. And like I said, I'm super excited by this result. Um, so let me give some um, empirical results. Uh, so empirical results where we're just comparing doing a discrete optimization to the optimization that we do for PSL. Uh, we're getting accuracies that are a little bit better uh, for a couple problems, but the big difference is the speed. You know, we're doing this much, much faster. Uh, for another problem, for image completion tasks, um, we are compared to kind of state-of-the-art methods, compared to deep belief networks, we're doing significantly better, and we can do it fast. Um, for activity recognition and video, we compare to an SVM that uses kind of state-of-the-art features that people in computer vision often use. We can add in a little bit of um, structure using PSL, and we get improved performance in two different settings. Um, in a domain where we're predicting drug target interaction, we're able to outperform kind of state of the art. And you know, this result was actually featured on the cover of uh, transactions on computational biology and bioinformatics. So we're able to do things 
fast on a bunch of different um, kinds of settings. Um, and so, in a nutshell, we have this probabilistic programming language that's particularly well suited for these graph settings. Um, it generalizes different ways of seeing these problems. I haven't talked about some of the other cool work about learning these, but um, uh, there's, we've done a lot of work in this space as well. And there's a bunch of groups using PSL, and we'd be happy if some Citrus folks uh, uh, were interested in using it as well. The kinds of applications, you know, I talked about the first two already. I'm very interested in these problems in computational social science where you're combining things like sentiment analysis, latent groups, bias and stance in political discourse. We have um, papers in this space and I'd be happy to talk about them. Um, we've done some work in uh, massive online open courses, kind of predicting engagement, uh, which is a form of personalization that's very interesting. Um, and then we've done a lot of work in information extraction and um, alignment. And so since I can't talk about all these, which I would love to do, but uh, we're low on time, I'll talk a little briefly about this one, uh, which gets back actually to um, my favorite problem, this graph identification problem of how you take a bunch of data sources, different heterogeneous data sources, and kind of put them together so that you can extract out some structure, extract out some kind of knowledge structure. And so we've done this in the context of inferring a knowledge graph. Uh, this is work that we've done with um, William Cohn and um, Tom Mitchell at CMU and their big project. We've also done it with Google, with their Knowledge Vault and some others. Where, But the general problem is you have some information extraction that has happened on web data. You have a bunch of facts that are inferred, are, are given, and then what you're trying to infer is a correct knowledge graph where you clean these up. And you combine information about um, statistics, about the reliability um, uh, and various features and feature counts, with some additional information about um, semantics, uh, subsumption, mutual exclusion, domain range kinds of things. And these together can help you do this inference. Um, so we start with an extraction graph. We perform graph identification, do the entity resolution link prediction and collective classification while we enforce ontological constraints and also model something about the source uncertainty. And a little fragment of this would be, um, you know, this is something that Nell extracted where we have um, different entities and labels for the entities and relationships, mutual exclusion, and so on. And we kind of do some reasoning. Again, this is like a teeny tiny fragment. So think of this on a much larger graph where we then extract out this nicer fact. So we've done this on um, three different kind of domains. One is NEL, uh, where um, this is an ongoing project at CMU. Uh, one is uh, Music Brains that's uh, been extracted from the web. Uh, and another is Freebase. This one's um, coming from Google. And um, the high level bit of kind of the different information we're able to combine, we're able to um, make use of all this information, and we're able to do this in, um, so combining them helps, and we can do this really fast. So um, the kinds of things that we're able to do this on knowledge graphs with, you know, millions of extractions in minutes and hours in comparison with um, 
kind of existing techniques that actually had to do some pretty serious hacks to get it to work, um, and then still took several days. So this is one domain where we're excited about our results. So uh, to close, I think there's a lot of opportunities in this space around data science for graphs. One is just basic new ML and stats theory for being able to deal with the kind of bias and um, dependencies that you have in the data. I mean, there is some work, obviously, but I think there's opportunity for much more as we get in these more heterogeneous settings. Um, I also think understanding the human in the data, the fact that we're no longer in this setting where it's this objective scientific data. There's a lot of biases in the data that we're trying to analyze and understanding that and actually making use of it is interesting. Um, there's a bunch of important topics that I haven't touched on, so privacy, ethics, and security. So next week there's a, a program where I'll come back and talk about privacy. That's kind of the flip side of this. Uh, and there's um, really exciting application domains. I think a lot of this stuff in uh, machine data is very interesting. Sensor networks is um, interesting. And you know, data science for social good is a compelling area. And let me close with a little bit of an advertisement. Um, so uh, this is uh, UC Santa Cruz. This is the building Citrus is at the very top floor. Pat has a very nice view out uh, above this. Uh, these are the Redwoods. This is the view out over Monterey. These are some of my colleagues, uh, machine learning and databases. Um, and these are um, five minutes away. Uh, so, and actually, the waves were really good the past couple days. So, so thanks. Any questions, please? Yes. You are. You showed us what PSL looks like in terms of XIs and XJs. Mm -hmm. What does it look like in terms of actual syntax? Um, well, I guess in particular, how do you deal with uh, identity uncertainty? So, in terms of syntax, I didn't include the slides that go through the syntax. Um, I can actually, unfortunately it's not in this deck, show you what an entity resolution uh, program looks like. Uh, but basically we, you know, have the predicates um, and uh, for entity resolution. Actually one of the interesting things about the programs for entity resolution is you can encode um, certain uh, blocking kinds of constraints so that you don't consider all possible resolutions. So, so there's more depth than I was able to cover here in terms of what you can include in the language. Um, yeah, I don't have something to flash up, but there, there's a declarative language um, uh, we have a number of the examples up on our uh, website, and then I can also send you, if you like, kind of templates for all three of the um, kind of the collective classification, the link prediction, and the entity resolution. So what the, what the, if the links are uncertain and they need to be inferred? For example, what if you have to infer causality from time series? What happens then? Okay, so I'll, I'll break it up into two yeah. questions. So what if the links are uncertain? That actually is something that our approach can um, handle. You can put in some information about, you don't have to put in 
you know, zero, one, the link exists or not, you can put in some information uh, about the uncertainty of the link existing, and that fits very well in our model. Causality is a very interesting question, and um, that's something actually we're just starting to do research into. I think that's a whole another can of worms and very interesting to do. Uh, when I show these rules, they may look like they have a causal, they're totally not causal. All they are is talking about correlations. And so it's quite interesting to extend this with um, semantics for inferring causality. And you mentioned uh, in your last slide about non-IIID data, yeah. which of course complicates things tremendously for all the techniques. Could you say a few words about that? So very much these techniques are techniques that are um, meant to help you have richer models that don't enforce an IID assumption. Um, the whole kind of set of dependencies that you can encode in these graphs is much richer than assuming um, a vanilla IID um, kind just, of just, assumption. Uh, just one quick follow-up uh, yeah. uh, is that if you do this, then you introduce the additional search into the model space, the modeling space. Are you using Greedy for that as well? Uh, so I did not talk about how we're doing the model search for Searching over the parameters, uh, we have a variety of techniques related to sure. uh, uh, for searching over the structures. Um, uh, we don't have anything that does that in a general way. The general way would likely end up being something that was a mix of greedy search plus maybe some domain constraints mm -hmm. that uh, restrict the model space. but. That's hugely interesting, and that actually connects to the discovering causal models in a very interesting way. Good. Any other questions? Yes. It, it wasn't apparent to me, at least, that time plays a role in the data, but suppose you knew the temporal sequence of, say, messages. How would you incorporate that information? Yeah, so the models that I showed weren't taking into account time. Um, the results that I showed for activity recognition in video, those actually did have a temporal model in them, but a very simple temporal model, so, so nothing fancy at all. Um, uh, so in terms of modeling uh, temporal information, I think there's room to do uh, much more than we've done so far, and it would be interesting to do that in a way that maintained the scalability. 